Good morning. Kalimera. <laughs> Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and you can just call me Gene. But I serve here as your lead pastor. And I heard a story about a curmudgeon. You know what that is? It's a grumpy person, and they're usually old. Well, he went to a church much like ours, where, for the most part, people were getting it. They were listening to the pastor's teaching. They were trying to live it out during the week. But this guy, not so much. He heard the messages about serving with joy, but just wasn't getting it. He'd come in every Sunday just complaining about everything, from the coffee to the worship, whatever there was to complain about. One Sunday in particular, it was the bathroom. He went into the bathroom and noticed eh, it was a little dirty. It didn't look like it had been cleaned. It wasn't the other people because he was the first one there. He noticed that the soap dispensers were half empty, this type of perspective. Not enough paper towels. So it was his job, or so he self-appointed himself to check all the bathroom stalls where he noticed that ah, some of the toilet paper was running out. He thought, we pay a janitor good money to do this. So I'm going to get on the pastor. He needs to do his job and get on this guy. Well, it's Sunday morning. And the pastor's doing what he probably should be doing. He's reviewing his message and praying and just in his office. This guy knows this, so of course, knocks on his door. The pastor says, yes, come in. And here's like the famous thing, right? I know you're busy, but, and then everything you wanted to say after that. So the pastor just doesn't say anything at all. He goes, you know, pastor, you really got to do your job. No, you got to get on that janitor. He's not doing his job. Bathroom's dirty. And so, good pastor goes, hmm, exactly that. Waits for long enough for it to be awkward, so the guy goes away. That's all you got to do. It's hard to do, right? But there's a lot of people who can't stand the silence, and so you take advantage of that if you're a good pastor. Right? Uncomfortable. So he makes him uncomfortable. Guy goes away. Next Sunday, guy shows up, beelines it for the bathroom. It's clean. Wow, sparkly clean. Soap dispensers full. All the paper towels to the brim. Toilet paper rolls. Not only are they full, three extra on the toilet tank, plus they got the hotel fold over the top. And so this answers the age-old question. Does the toilet paper go this way or that way? Clearly that way. So you can get the hotel, a little foldy thing, right? So it's all done like that. He is happy for once. So he's washing his hand. Another church member comes over and washing a hand. See how clean the bathrooms are, he says to the other guy. The other guy, he's like, I guess so. He's like, you know how that happened? And the guy says, you cleaned it? No, we pay a janitor good money for that. I got on the pastor. I said, pastor, you do your job. And you know what? He did because he went and he got the janitor to clean the bathroom. I worked in management. <laughs> so the other guy says, look, I believe that you worked in management, but what I can't believe is that the janitor cleaned the bathroom. And the guy says, Why? Well, the janitor died three weeks ago. Couldn't have been him. Well, he's a little embarrassed at this point, so he's just quiet. He's got to know about the bathroom. Next week, he wakes up an hour early. He gets to church an hour early. He beelines it for the bathroom, swings open the door, and sure enough, there's someone cleaning the bathroom. The pastor. <laughs> and no, that didn't happen. <laughs> I'm not talking about any of you, and I'm not talking about myself. It just goes with the application today, which is basically, it's not about you or me. <laughs> We're going to talk about serving selflessly. We are in the rest of the story. We looked at King Josiah, and we saw that he didn't finish strong. No matter what way you look at it, and we had some people sympathizing with Josiah. I, like, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But no matter what way you looked at it, he dies. 
Well, we all die. But he dies unnecessarily. Pharaoh Necho kills him, right? So he's not checking with the Lord like he should be. He dies. This gives an opening for Pharaoh Necho to come in and take his son Jehoahaz away. So it causes problems for everybody. But you were doing so well was the theme, something we really don't want to hear. <laughs> so now, here's what happens. We're going to jump right in, 2 Kings 23, 34. Pharaoh Necho then installed Eliakim, another of Josiah's sons, to reign in place of his father, and he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz was taken to Egypt as a prisoner where he died. I already told you that. In order to get the silver and gold demanded as tribute by Pharaoh Necho, Jehoiakim collected a tax from the people of Judah, requiring them to pay in proportion to their wealth. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother was Ebediah, the daughter of Pedaiah from Ramah. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. We've seen that the prophets weave their way through these accounts of the kings. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, they run parallel-ish. And it's super confusing. So, and by your request, you said it's helpful, I made you guys a chart. All right. So, again, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. So, the cartoon me, not drawn by me. Someone did that for me. I didn't do it if I did it bigger biceps. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> so 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles are running in parallel-ish. But then we have the prophets kind of go right in there, and it's confusing, right? Because if you're reading your Bible, Jeremiah is all the way over there. <laughs> 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. So it's really confusing. And when you get to Jeremiah, it gets worse because Jeremiah jumps around a lot. It's not in chronological order, so it gets super-duper confusing. So I took the time to show you where it goes, where it is in chronological-ish order. And you don't always know because sometimes it doesn't tell you. We'll see, ah, the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. There we know. But sometimes it just says nothing early in his reign. So you just got to kind of put it somewhere. So I'm doing my best for you guys on this. And we're kind of making it go chronological. And I disclaimer it with ish, chronological-ish. That's the chart. It's in the app, correct, I think. So anyway, you can check it out on your own screenshot it if you want. Jeremiah 22, 13. And the Lord says, What sorrow awaits Jehoiakim who builds his palace with forced labor? He builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. And so this kind of rebuke continues to verse 33 or 23 of that chapter. The point, Jehoiakim is selfish. So he's a selfish, self-centered type of king. So we've seen this good king, bad king, good king, bad king. So now we're going to hop around a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize it for you. I actually intended to kind of go through it a little more in depth. And I realized something. that Not only do they give the names of these people that are interacting, they give like their father's names and their grandfather's names. And then you're like, who are we talking about again? So I'm going to try to not do that and unconfuse you if that's entirely possible. So Jeremiah 25. We have the 70 years of captivity predicted. So what's going to happen is there's going to be like three rounds where now Nebuchadnezzar, after Nico, is going to be taking the kings away. So he's going to invade, take a king away, invade, take a king away, and he's going to install other kings. Last one, Zedekiah, Mataniah. We'll get to that later. And then it's going to fall. After Jerusalem falls, 70 years in exile. And so that's what's being predicted here. But the pattern of the prophets goes something like this. You're bad. And really bad, now, if you're new and you're new to this whole thing, don't think, mean, angry God. No, they're killing their own children. They deserve it, right? It's justified. So you're bad, Israel, but you're like children to me, so I'm going to restore you, and I'm going to punish the people that went too far in punishing you. So he uses, like Nebuchadnezzar, these people to punish them. And so there's restoration at the end. So that's what you're seeing here. There's always a pattern of this in the prophets. Don't use that as an excuse not to read it. Go read it for yourself. Then you see the Lord's cup of anger. And this is kind of a theme all throughout the prophets and all the way from Jeremiah to Jesus, right? Garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup from me. 
but your will be done, Father, not mine, right? So it's the cup of God's wrath, and so this is a theme. So Jeremiah is symbolically going to take this to all the nations on behalf of the Lord and pour out the wrath on everyone of God. So 26, you can turn the page, Lonnie. Jeremiah speaks fact checkers. <laughs> Sounds like something else when I said it fast last time, so I make sure I enunciate there. <laughs> so then Jeremiah, what's going to happen here? He speaks at, at the temple, and he's warning them again. This is going to be judgment. If you turn from your ways, it might be good, but you know, you're not. So he's going to destroy the temple. You're going to be an object of cursing. So he's prophesying all these bad things against the people. They don't like it. So they seize him. And they kind of put him on like a little quick trial type of thing. And the wise people there are like, no. Micah of Moresheth prophesied the same type of thing during Hezekiah's time, and we didn't kill him. They want to kill him. So he gets away, but there's another prophet, Uriah. Not so lucky. He tries to escape to Egypt, but they bring him back and they kill him. That is the summary of chapter 26. Chapter 35 is super interesting. It's the Rechabites. And you might, might remember this when we looked at Jehu. Jehu's the guy who's driving like a madman. So basically, he's from Naples. No. So <laughs> Jehu, Jehu, if you remember, he killed all the worshipers of Baal. Right? So he tricks them. He's like, come on, you can see the way I worship Baal. And he gathers them all in one place and has them slaughtered, identifying them by wearing special robes. But through that process, he gets this guy, Jehonadab, son of Rechab the Rechabites. And basically what he's doing is he's like, look at how, how awesome I am. You know, like you think you worship the Lord? Watch this zeal. Because they're known as people who follow the rules, right, that their ancestor, Rechab, gave them. Uh, the thing here is, simply put, we don't know too much about them except that and this, but they're not supposed to settle down. That's the point. So don't plant vineyards, don't live in houses, live in tents. Don't drink alcohol. Back up. Don't have houses, live in tents, specifically for these people. Why? Well, what do the Israelites do? Well, they intermarry, which they shouldn't have done, because their wives are worshiping other gods, intermarry with other people, that is. So they don't want to be susceptible to kind of like settling down somewhere and then adopting that culture's customs, which would then include the worship of false gods. We don't want to do that. That's the whole point for this thing. So what happens if you want to make wine? You got to plant a vineyard and you got to stay around for a while. And so that's the point. So some people have proof texted this and said, ah, this means you shouldn't drink alcohol. <clears throat> Wrong. This is not what this is about. It's just about not adhering to the cultures. It immediately moves on. Like be like the Rechabites, but then it says don't worship false gods. It doesn't say don't drink wine because we see even Jesus does. So clearly that can't be a sin. First miracle, water into wine. We looked at Timothy last week, right? Drink wine from now on, not just water. Why? It has alcohol in it, kills the bacteria. So for merriment and medicine, wine's okay. What's the problem? When you drink too much. If you can't handle it, don't be a drunkard. That is the point here. So here's the thing. The Lord kind of gives like a little test here as an illustration. Check these people out, the Rechabites, they're faithful. Jeremiah, bring him into the temple and give him some wine, like offer them wine. He does, they say, no, because that's wrong. Our ancestor told us not to do that. That is chapter 35, summarized. Now, chapter 36, starting at verse 1. During the fourth year that Jehoiakim, who we talked about, son of Josiah, was king in Judah, the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. Get a scroll and write down all my messages against Israel, Judah, and the other nations. Begin with the first message back in the days of Josiah and write down every message right up to the present time. Perhaps the people of Judah will, will repent when they hear again all the terrible things I have planned for them. Then I will be able to forgive their sins and wrongdoings. So Jeremiah sent for Baruch, son of Neriah, and as Jeremiah dictated all the prophecies that the Lord had given him, Baruch wrote them on a scroll. Then Jeremiah said to Baruch, I am a prisoner here and unable to go to the temple. So you go to the temple on the next day of fasting and read the messages from the Lord that I've had you write on this scroll. Read them so the people who are there from all over Judah will hear them. So just a couple of things about this text. 
I use an NLT because everybody kind of understands it. That's it. So my point here is not to show off. It is to get you to know this stuff. I am a teacher. And if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you leave understanding this a little better. And so when we read from really complicated versions, nobody leaves understanding it. And if we're being really honest, <laughs> very few people understand the Bible that they're holding in their hands. So I keep a simple version. And when it kind of detours a little bit, I put the brackets in and fix it with the Greek. So I got my Greek teacher here today, and I text her a lot. All right, so I can read Greek pretty well. According to her, I cannot speak at all. I have an accent. I'm really, really bad. But <laughs> I can read the biblical Greek. OK, getting better couple problems with this, just if you're thinking logically. So remember something. Where did Jeremiah offer the wine to the Rechabites, the temple? So why can't he go to the temple now? No. So he's restrained from going to the temple. Better, better translation. He's not in prison yet. That happens during Zedekiah's reign. And he goes in like a house arrest, let's just say the secretary, I think Jonathan's house, and then he gets put in a cistern. Not yet. That's not happening yet. So again, it jumps all over the place. It gets confusing. He's restrained from going to the temple. I think that's a better translation. So to summarize, this is a very confusing chapter because here, the names, the grandson of this, the grandson. It's crazy. I'll make it simple and just give you the point. So Baruch, some people say Baruch. You can say it any way you want because I don't speak Hebrew, and no matter how I say it, it's probably wrong, just like the Greek. So say it however you memorize it. Some people say Baruch, Baruch. I listen to like a Jewish rabbi saying it. It sounds like Baruch to me. Could be wrong. Let's move on. The point of the story so he's taking these messages, he does what Jeremiah tells him to do, he takes the messages and he's reading them in like the courtyard of the temple. And so there's these rooms and someone, Micaiah, hears it, and I won't do too many names for you, hears him saying it and he goes down and he tells like the officials, whoa, this is what's being said, go get Baruch, have him read it to us. He reads it to the officials. All right, so they get the word and they're kind of a little shocked. They're like, uh-oh, this is bad. Tells him a couple things. You and Jeremiah go hide. <laughs> You're going to need to hide. This is a bad message, right? So kill the messenger, don't kill the messenger. So then they send someone, let the king know. The king ends up hearing the messages. He's in a winterized part of the palace, it says, so he's sitting by a fire. That's significant because when he hears the message, he cuts the scroll and throws each piece, like every few lines, into the fire. He burns it unrepentantly. That's the sum summary there. And it's going to bring us to our application. So Jeremiah 36, 23. Each time Jehudi finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife, cut off that section of the scroll, then he threw it into the fire section by section until the whole scroll was burned up. Neither the king or his attendants showed any signs of fear or repentance at what they heard. Even when Elnathan, Deliah, and Gemariah begged the king not to burn the scroll, he wouldn't listen. So... What he does is he commands his sons to arrest Jeremiah, but they remain hidden, him and Baruch. And then after the king burned the scroll, God gives Jeremiah another message. Essentially, to wrap it up, write it down again. Do it again, but this time, add more. And so he's going to say, no, 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 you can't stop the word of God from happening. So what we're going to do now on that chart, we don't have the chart up, but we're going to jump now from 36 to 45. It's all happening in the same time frame, kind of why it's difficult, right? Nine chapter jump. Jeremiah 45.1, the prophet Jeremiah gave this message to Baruch, son of Uriah, in the fourth year. So see it's similar there, fourth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. After Baruch had written down everything Jeremiah had dictated to him, he said, this is what the God of Israel says to you, Baruch. You have said, I'm overwhelmed with trouble. Haven't I had enough pain already? And now the Lord has added more. I am worn out from sighing and I can find no rest. Baruch, this is what the Lord says. I will destroy this nation that I built. I will uproot what I planted. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Don't do it. I will bring great disaster upon all these people. But I will give you your life as a reward wherever you go. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now again, big jump which makes it confusing. So this is happening around the same time as chapter 36, clearly. We see here that Baruch complains in his service to the Lord. So I just want to do a quick 
thing here uh, in case there's new people. And you can go back to this series, at the beginning of the series, if you want to learn more about this, if it interests you. If it doesn't, just stop listening to me for the next two minutes and 30 seconds. So anyway, if we get that picture up, we talked about something in Protestantism. We are a non-denominational church, right? So <laughs> we're not denominational. In Protestantism, they call these apocryphal books, and they're kind of got like a bad reputation. So I just want to give you a very, very brief history lesson. So Baruch is a book. It's called Apocryphal by Protestants, by Catholics, deuterocanonical, and I think by Orthodox, they don't even designate it. They just put it in right there after Jeremiah with like a couple other things like the epistle from Jeremiah in there. So it's just mixed in the text. And so I wanted to show you this again. That is a 1611 King James Bible. I'm showing off some of my Bible collection. That's not even all of them. But anyway, it's right there in there, <laughs> 1611. And it was in all English Bibles until the mid-1800s. So about the first 1,800 years of Christianity, Christians were reading from them. There's an Orthodox Bible behind it. It's in there. And the 1560 Geneva Bible. Yes, there are other English translations before the mighty King James Bible. We can get into why they were taken out later. It's not for theological reasons. If you go to the oldest Christian Bibles that we have all the way back to about 350 A.D., all in Greek, complete copies. All in Greek, even the Old Testament, because Greek is the lingua franca. The apostles are writing that, right? The people writing the New Testaments are writing in Greek. They're quoting the Greek, the New Testaments. That was funny. The New Testament books, they're quoting the Greek version. So the oldest copies we have, all Greek. And Baruch's in there. So those apocryphal books are all in there with no delineation whether they're apocryphal or not. Food for thought. So we're going to take a quick peek at this book. And I'm not saying necessarily that it's scripture. I'm not taking any stance on one side or the other. It's just that even as Martin Luther said, they're good to read. They were in his German translation. Interesting. So Baruch, when we look at it, the name Baruch means blessed. It means blessed. Probably not written by him. Probably written a little bit later. Pseudo Pseudopographical. Pseudopographical, it's called. Hard word to say, but think about Song of Songs, or is it Song of Solomon? Because that's probably also in the same category. And so even for the Protestants listening, ah, some of your books, we don't know who wrote them, like Hebrews. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wrote it. That's why. It's not really important. So Baruch, summary, real quick. First two chapters, they're kind of like a petition and confession about what's going on here, about what these Israelites are doing. So petition, confession. He continues, it's really interesting, chapter 3, if you take the time to read it. Wisdom woman, the wisdom woman personified like the Proverbs. That was a mouthful. Like the Proverbs. We see that in the Proverbs. Wisdom is personified as a, wi a woman. She's doing the, he's doing the same thing here. It's a woman. Chapter 4, like a mother speaking to her children. It kind of ties very nicely in there to Israel. And then five, the pattern of the prophets again. Promised restoration. But something interesting. Chapter 4, 26. They're described as pampered children. Pampered children. I can take questions later if that's a hand going up. That's awesome, though. Actually, you know what? I'll... Did someone raise their hand? I'll take the question. Go ahead. What's your question? Oh. oh. All right. Well, you should have asked me a question, like a really hard one. Like, what's your name? <laughs> it's all, you're good. You're totally good. <laughs> pampered ones. I hope you're not a pampered. You're okay. Pampered ones. That's how they're described. Let's go back to Jeremiah 45, too. And you can stretch if you... You know what? We should have, like, a stretch break because I go long sometimes, right? So, like, after about, like, what are we at? 20 minutes? 30 minutes? Everybody, 20 or 30 minutes, should be like, everybody get up. Just stretch out a little, a little bit. You might have just started a new thing. Don't raise your hand over there. I'm not going to take any more questions. But the, <laughs> So, if you haven't been to Bible study, it's really funny. I make everyone raise their hands. It's like a contest. They raise their hands. And so, what happens is the ladies are always playing with their hair. And it looks like a hand to me because, like, I need to wear my glasses and I don't wear them because glare. That's why I can't see. So lesser of two evils, and so the women are doing this, and I call on people, and they're like, what was the question again? So, <laughs> Let's go back to Jeremiah in 45.2. 
And, and again, yes, it's really easy to get me to go on like a tangent. The, the staff does it all the time. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you, Baruch. You have said, I'm overwhelmed with trouble. Haven't I had enough pain already? And now the Lord has added more. I'm worn out from sighing and can find no rest. Baruch, this is what the Lord says. I will destroy this nation that I built. I will uproot what I planted. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Don't do it. I will bring great disaster upon all these people. But I will give you your life as a reward. Wherever you go, I, the Lord, have spoken. So we see, again, Baruch has a moment of selfishness because he's greatly inconvenienced, right? These people are getting chased around everywhere, lives threatened in service of the Lord. Get it. But check this out for perspective. The life I give you is enough. Don't see great. Your life is enough. That's it. So God's perspective here. Calm down. Now, we see that Jeremiah, he lives a life of inconvenience. It's going to get worse. We're going to see that. So we see a theme here. Contrasted by Jehoiakim's unwillingness to be inconvenienced by the very word of the Lord. Think about that. When we look at our service to the Lord, both inside and outside the church, do we see it as an inconvenience? Is that the way we're looking at it? Do we not want to be inconvenienced by the word of the Lord? You see, the Bible commands us to do some pretty inconvenient things if we're being honest. But throughout the full counsel of God's word, throughout the entire Bible, we see that we are supposed to be serving selflessly. Selflessly. So as you serve God, beware of focusing on what you're giving up as opposed to who you should be serving. And certainly, don't seek great things for yourself. So what does serving selflessly look like? Well, Jesus, pretty redundant. We can put it up on the screen. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> you did well with that. So here's the point. And Jesus is kind of redundant here. There's a prerequisite to following him, to being baptized. And a lot of people miss it. So you see these like happy, happy baptism type of party things, right? Sometimes they do it at a water park, right? And it's just like they don't explain anything. It's true. <laughs> they don't explain. It really is. They don't explain anything. you got a beach here. Why would you? Anyway. So another, stop, another tangent. Good. Stay on target. If you know what movie that's from, I love you. So, <laughs> so, Baptism. Jesus gives the prerequisites. And so what happens is you get everyone emotionally stirred up. And this is what we don't do here, right? So get the worship team going. Get everybody all riled up. And let's go. You want to be baptized? Go into the water. And that's it. But you don't understand. You don't know what you're getting into. What, what did it say in 2 Timothy? All who want to live a godly life, right, in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we talked about varying degrees of persecution. It could be at the workplace, verbal, whatever. It's a warning, right? But not, if you want to call yourself a Christian, you'll suffer. Nope. If you want to live a godly life. This means Jesus warned us, right? Like, I've, I've come to bring a sword, not to fight. But I'm going to divide families. I'm going to divide friendships. This is going to be rough, really hard. But here's the hardest part. This is what he says, and I just put them all on there, redundant. He's saying it a lot. The prerequisites, deny yourself. You have to deny yourself, total self-denial, and in different forms. Whoever doesn't get rid of their self, deny yourself, cannot follow me. That's it. Can't. Then pick up your cross. There's that persecution. It might not be a literal cross, but you're going to suffer for me. Why? Well, 
The Bible says some very inconvenient things. And if you begin doing those things, you're going to suffer. Well, you might suffer loss of family members, friends, all that stuff, because they don't want, like what you're talking about, because the word sounds nothing like the world. Nothing. And so you start talking like that, you're crazy. You start living like that, you're crazy. You're different. Deny yourself. Gonna suffer. Then you can follow me. And I put it up there a lot of times so that you can see I'm not lying or make, making this up. Look it up for yourself. Jesus says this is not going to be convenient. It's not promised in there anywhere. You have to take Scripture out of context, which is a very popular thing to do, unfortunately. We'll look at that a little bit later. Following Jesus begins with self-denial. And, and you're like, you're going to make this worse, Pastor? Yeah, because Jesus did. So Matthew 6, 1. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> you got to read larger passages. I give the analogy. I've given it a thousand times, so I'll keep it short. Like people read the Bible like watching a movie, like five seconds of, move, of a movie a day or a week, right? You know, and then like they don't even, how can you remember in two or three years what the movie was about? But then they'll take that quote totally out of context and use it. And you're like, huh? If you read the Bible, that doesn't go there. So what you should do is not, Read Matthew 5 and stop because you're interrupting Jesus. You have to read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. All one, no stopping. He's just, it's his sermon. So it's like walking out of Jesus' sermon. It's kind of rude. Right? So, so don't do that. But think about it, right? Like if you listen to the first couple minutes, you'd be like, this dude just talked about bathrooms and toilet paper rolls. That's all I got out of the message, right? It's going somewhere. Well, Jesus is like kind of a whole lot better than me. So it's going somewhere. So people do this. They read Matthew 5, right? So we're going to read like four verses of Matthew 5. Or I'm going to read four verses, and then we're going to preach on that all day, right? And so here's what you get. Right? You're like salt. You're, 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 you're a light on a hill. Who, who puts a lamp under a basket? You're a city on a hill, right? It has to be seen. Let's preach on that. And so that means you got to go out there and make sure you take selfies of yourself and put it all over the Internet, patronizing homeless people. That's done, yeah. You've seen that done. Former megachurch pastor knows all about it. Because they stopped there. They didn't keep reading. Cross the six out in your Bible. There's no six. It's just Jesus talking. Because then he clarifies. Watch out, though. Watch out. Don't, don't do that stuff. Don't take the selfies. That's no good. You'll lose your reward if you do that. Because why? It's about you. Anytime. So here's like the litmus test. You can apply this. It's a simple version. Anytime a preacher makes this about you, it's wrong. This is not about you. It's about the Lord God Almighty and worshiping him. I'm not going to get into the Greek because we did that at Bible study. But look. It's like the Greek, it's like a dog licking a master when he comes home. That's what the word worship means. But you have people out there, I'm going to get my worship on. I won't do that again. But anyway, terrible song. Hate it. We're never going to sing that here because it's ridiculous. Get your worship on? Worship is like, you know, read Revelation. The Lord God shows up. Everybody's deaf, you know, and we're just like, ah, that's worship. That's worship. This is the word of God. It's about Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. That's it. Not you. We're mere servants saved by his grace and mercy. That's it. Not about you. If it does not point to Jesus and Jesus alone, it's false. That's it. That's what this book is about. Jesus. And we are to worship him. 
no reward. It's almost like when we serve our master, we should serve in a way in which we know he's always watching. That's who I'm serving. And that's what the Bible says. When you serve another person, you're serving the Lord. That's worship. Be a living sacrifice, Romans 12. Be a living sacrifice. That's worship. That's worship. Serve the Lord by serving others. Jesus is going to see it. You don't need the self. And he's the only one that matters anyway. I don't care. Paul says that. Galatians, right? Like, I've lost my interest in the world, and the world's lost its interest in me. I'm done. I don't care what you all think. Right? I'm preaching to him. <laughs> I hope I'm getting this right. That's it. All right? I cannot care. I just want to love you. And so we can get to Jesus. That's it. Why are you serving me like that? Because, ah, Jesus. And that's it. The Holy Spirit, he'll just do the rest. I don't have to do anything else. You see, here's the thing. Our fruit will be an evident product of our works. It'll be evident. We don't have to, like, shine an extra light on it. It's just going to be evident. If we're doing the right thing, people are going to notice. Now, we see... And we're gonna, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. We're going to go to Philippians today. We see how, yes, kafhima, did I say that right? Oh, I got a word right. So you can say, you were right. We, we, worked, we, worked, we worked on this, but I got two thumbs up. <laughs> so we see that Paul does boast in a good way. We looked at this. Pride, never a good thing. If it's no, 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 not a good thing. But this kafhima is a good thing when it's done towards someone else without any other ulterior motives. That's good. That's good boasting. Bad boasting, and Paul says, I'm going to boast, and this is not good. Or you're boasting, 1 Corinthians 5, that's bad boasting. Right? So it can be good or bad depending on where it's directed and how it's being said. But here's the thing, Proverbs 27, 2. Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. We must serve with humility, knowing that the Lord will reward us. What can be better than the crown of righteousness that he is going to give us that then we'll lay back at his feet? Think about the attitude. Important. And here's the other thing. I see people do this. I've seen pastors do this. God knows your heart. You've got to be careful. <laughs> There's a couple of pastors doing this nonsense, and it was so obvious, right? So it's one of those, like, okay, I'm not going to take the selfies. I know that's wrong. But here's the thing, bro. Take a picture of me doing this. Right? And then you post that about me, and I'll post that about you. It's called manipulation. It makes it worse. Know the Lord only. We must serve with humility. This produces good fruit. When we don't serve with humility, it produces bad fruit every single time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. This week, I want to set the stage beginning with our attitude. Attitude. So we're going to go to Philippians because it talks a lot about attitude. So we did this thing last week. If you were here, 2 Timothy, I overviewed the book for you. Right? So it's good because it gives us the context. What's this really about? Don't just pluck a line out. No. What, why is this letter, it's what that is, being written to Timothy? Right? So we looked at that, finishing strong. Right? He's trying to get... Timothy, to finish the race strong. He thinks he's probably going to die soon. That's Paul. Right? He's in prison. Talks a lot about suffering, but keep going. Finish the race strong. Right? Citizen of heaven. We'll see that in Philippians. So Philippians is like the greatest theological thank you note ever written. That's really what it's all about. Paul is in prison. That's the context. They send a guy, Epaphroditus, to bring him a gift, right? Help him out in prison. And then he sends Epaphroditus back with the letter to the Philippians. And that's what we get here. So, Paul's going to talk about suffering. He's going to thank them. He's going to use Timothy and Epaphroditus as examples. You know, Epaphroditus almost died in this service to me. He almost died. So he's kind of cool. Look at Timothy. I have no one else like him. He's pretty cool. Listen to him. Why? Because they're being like Jesus. So that's the good kafima, that's the good boasting, right? So he's doing good boasting, like, no, just keep going. I'm in jail. It gives us a lot of perspective. And no, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Stop it, unless you're talking about enduring 
suffering. Because the next line is what? Nobody knows it. Yet you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Flipsy? Is it flipsy? Like crushing. Affliction. Also used for tribulation. Flipsis? Flipsis? Yeah, yeah. Tribulation. Crushing. So picture in your mind, like this is not going to be a Greek thought, but like an American thought, like the Salem witch trials or something, you know, where they're putting the stones on top of people to crush them. That's what he says next. I can do all things. I can lay under like a ton of rocks because Christ gives me the strength to do that. That's the proper translation. It's not about your new job, your football game, or a car. It's about suffering for Jesus. So check this out. Paul, here's his attitude. So he does the introductions that he does and his greetings and stuff. Philippians 1.24, I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I've been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. Dying is gain, some translations will say. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I don't really know which is better. This is an interesting guy. It's called a Christian. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to see you again, you will have even more reason, if it says pride, cross it out, that's kafima, not pride, but boast in a good way here in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together in one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, not physically fighting, fighting together for the faith, enduring on for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We're in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. Wow. That doesn't sound like a megachurch verse, does it? Nope. A lot of Christians have never heard that. And that's sad because that's Paul's attitude. And he's telling them, you need to have that attitude. You're going to suffer with me. We're all suffering. Think about it. You know, like a pastor saying this, like, you know, guys, just this morning, a little difficult for me, so just pray for me because this message is really difficult because I just want to die and be with the Lord. Really just because I want to, you know, but for your sakes, I'll, I'll try my best to get through the message. I really I cannot wait to die. I can't wait. It's the only way you can get the resurrection, correct? Paul is like, it would be better for me to die. But for you guys, uh, I'll stick around. There we go. You know what I mean, right? So talk about serving selflessly. Amazing. If we turn the page, Philippians 2. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. Don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Think of others better than you. Even if you disagree with them, don't argue. He'll go on to say, do these things without grumbling or complaining. He says that. In other words, be like Jesus. So there, a lot of people don't know it. Some Bibles are really good with this. They tell you when something's like a saying, a poem, or a prayer. Paul will sometimes say, this is a trustworthy saying, and then he'll give you 
So they have these little recitals that they do in church. Kind of like all denominations will do the Lord's Prayer, right? Most of us have that memorized. And so we pray a memorized thing. And so they were doing this in the early church too. And one of my favorites, if you've been around for a while, is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I don't have a favorite verse of the day, but I have favorite like sections of Scripture. And it's important because it gives us the attitude and the nature of Christ, who he is and what he did for us. And so I do this a lot at Bible study. Like So it, I could repeat this every church service. It's so important. It's critical to understand Jesus. We have to understand him. And so these verses help us with that. So I often recite them over and over again. As I close this morning, I kind of want to do it in the form of a prayer. And I want you to meditate on these verses. I want you to absorb these verses. I'm not even going to put it on the screen. Just, just, just absorb the verses. Go read them when you write it down. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. There you go. Absorb this into your very being this morning. And I hope it stays with you and you, you go out and you become vehicles for the gospel. Because, it says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be taken advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow or bend. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All those in heaven and on earth and below the earth. To the glory of God the Father. Amen.